Good evening. Welcome to Northwest Tonight with Annabelle Tiffin. Our top story, two scouts, two tragic deaths, 20 years apart. Now their mothers join forces to demand a public inquiry into how Britain's biggest youth organisation is run. They also want the scouts to be overseen by a new regulatory body. Also tonight, a Merseyside teenager convicted of terrorism offences says he was motivated by a hatred of the government. I'll be a homegrown terrorist because I was born on British soil. I'm British. I am doing attacks on British soil. Pollution in Windermere. A conservation group says sewage is killing off insect life in the streams that feed the lake. There's a seriously viral video going around of a guy giving a woman unsolicited advice on her golf swing. How that classic piece of mansplaining sent this Merseyside Golf Pro's practice video around the world. And look at the rainbow from the showers today. Andrew captured this picture of Manchester City Centre from Ashton. How's it looking for this weekend? Any more rainbows? Join me at the end of the programme. I'll give you all the details. Two mums from the northwest whose sons died on scout trips are calling for a public inquiry and an official regulator to be brought in. As we reported yesterday, an inquest found neglect by the Scout Association contributed to the death of Ben Leonard from Stockport while he was on a trip to North Wales with Reddish Explorer Scouts. His family has been supported by the family of Scott Fanning, who died in similar circumstances 25 years ago. Phil McCann reports. He was kind. Caring, funny, witty. He was a lovely, lovely lad. Ben was brilliant from day one. He was, he was an extraordinary person. Ben was looking forward to his camping trip with the Explorer Scouts, but as he was climbing up the Great Orm in Clandidno, he slipped and fell 200 feet down the cliffs. He died from fatal head injuries. There'd been no risk assessment for the trip, there was no discussion about safety, and there was no accredited first aider. That was five years ago. Yesterday, an inquest jury here in Manchester concluded scout leader Sean Glaister was responsible for Ben's unlawful killing. Also responsible, his assistant, Mary Carr, seen here in the blue jacket. The jury found neglect by the Scout Association contributed to Ben's death. It was the third inquest into Ben's death. Two others had been abandoned after problems with the Scout Association's evidence. I don't know how some of them sleep at night with what they've done um, and the way they've treated us. Ben's Explorer Scout Group was based here, along with other unrelated scout groups. But when Sean Glaister, the scout leader, gave evidence, the inquest heard the Scout Association never monitored his activities or ensured he'd done any training he was supposed to have done. He agreed that he'd been hung out to dry and said this could have happened to any of the leaders on any of the trips we went on. It was scouts, it was like, like when they go to school, you just trust. 25 years ago, Scott Fanning, who was 11, died at Ashworth Valley Scout Camp in Haywood. His mum's become friends with Ben's family and has been trying to help them get answers. I felt as if my son's life had meant nothing, really. Uh, nobody had learnt from it, he'd been forgotten, um, and they hadn't made the changes that they had every opportunity to mm. make. 20 years? Yeah. Now both families want a public inquiry to look into the Scouts and an official safety regulator for the organisation. They'll say they are regulated. The Charity Commission don't regulate them as like somebody like Ofsted or something like the schools are, like other out outdoor activity centres are. The Scout Association isn't commenting on their calls, but it says it's already made changes as a result of Ben's death and is committed to learning. It says it'll do everything in its power to stop such a tragic event happening again. Phil McCann, BBC Northwest Tonight, Reddish. Next tonight, a Liverpool College student who plotted to kill 50 people from a bedroom in his mother's house has been found guilty of terror offences. When he was still a teenager, Jacob Graham hid bomb-making chemicals in woodland near Formby and planned to use a 3D printer to make a submachine gun. Katie Barnfield reports. It's a nice bit of case. Showing off a machete from his bedroom at his mum's house in Norris Green. Comes in a little, a little sheath. This is one of more than 100 videos made by Jacob Graham. 
Calling himself Destro the Destroyer, he'd claimed he wanted to kill at least 50 people. Graham had written a manual he called the Freedom Encyclopedia, which explains in detail how to make weapons and explosives, including pipe bombs, gunpowder and car bombs. He dedicated it, he said, to misfits, anarchists and terrorists who wanted to fight against the government. Jacob Graham was arrested last May when he was just 19. After searching his room and his mum's home, police found chemicals used to make explosives, as well as weapons including a bow and arrows and a 3D printer, along with instructions on how to use it to make an assault rifle. I also want to educate people on how, um, how, any, how anybody could do this, anybody with a motive. The jury at Manchester Crown Court were told Graham's idol was US terrorist Theodore Kaczynski, also known as the Unabomber. The court also heard he'd written plans to attack government buildings and politicians' houses, calling them tyrannical and oppressive against working-class people. You see a lot of uh, a lot more of this sort of experience in, say, Greece and places like that. Greece, Italy, tends to get a lot of far left extremism, but less so here in the UK. To think that age is in any way a barrier to someone becoming a terrorist um, is is just quite frankly negligent. Jacob Graham was cleared today of planning a terrorist attack, but convicted of seven other terror offences for which he'll be sentenced next month. That's what I'll be marked as. I'll be a homegrown terrorist. Because... Counter-terror police said his case was a prime example of online extremism, where a young man had been radicalised without ever leaving his bedroom. Katie Barnfield, BBC Northwest Tonight, in Manchester. Lucy Letby's bid to challenge her convictions will be considered by the Court of Appeal at a hearing in April. In August, the nurse was found guilty of murdering seven babies and attempting to kill another six at the Countess of Chester Hospital in 2015 and 2016. She was sentenced to spend the rest of her life in prison. As you may have just seen, John Savadant, known for playing Fred Elliott in Coronation Street, has died aged 86. John was on our screens for 12 years and joined the Manchester-based soap in 1994. He quickly became a favourite with viewers thanks to his huge personality and loud voice. His agents said he was a much-loved husband and father of two and will be sorely missed by all who knew him. Two police officers are being investigated for gross misconduct after being accused of assaulting a Barrow football fan. The police watchdog is investigating whether unjustified force was used against Edward Pappas outside Walsall's ground last March. Last month, the court cleared Mr Pappas of attacking the police. Now, it's two years since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Thousands of refugees have settled here in the UK. So how are they feeling on this second anniversary of the war? Well, our reporter Eunice Muller has been to Arnside in Cumbria, which took in more than 50 people in 2021. Olga Kalashnikova enjoys working at a cafe here in Arnside. She arrived in Cumbria as part of the Homes for Ukraine scheme following the Russian invasion two years ago. It was the, ha uh, the hardest time for me and uh, my family as well. We, we, uh, we said uh, goodbye to each other and uh, there was a Ukrainian community and on site uh, I have some friends uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very good. Mother and son are still living with their original host family and have settled in. Considering her circumstances, family back in Ukraine, she's settled in ever so well with her young son. He's in the local school. His English is superb, being a young student. This small village of Arnside only has a population of a few thousand, but it led the way in welcoming refugees from Ukraine. And across Cumbria, more than 500 people have settled. Katarina Shalantosa is a self-employed teacher and lives with her mother and grandmother. The government has said refugees like her can apply for an 18-month extension to their visa. Before we found out about the extension of our program here, so we were worried uh, or about how we would live, uh, where we would live, but now it's a bit like clear. Katarina's mum, Ksenia, works as a chef. That's allowed the family to live independently. 
People, when they came over, would struggle to find jobs. And so it just meant that they were at home all the time and obviously thinking about what was going on back in the Ukraine. I think. So actually giving them a job and something to focus on um, during the working day actually benefited. Um. Anna Gorse was behind efforts to bring at least 50 Ukrainians to our side. And she believes more can still be done. The thing is that central government gave local government a huge pot of money per head. Um, to resettle these people and thus far we haven't really seen any of it so what we're really hoping for now is some help from local government to allow these people some independence. Over 140,000 people from Ukraine have come to stay in the UK. Communities like those here in Arnside are doing their best to make them feel welcome. Yenis Muller, BBC Northwest, tonight Arnside. Now, we've reported before on claims that the water in our largest lake, Windermere, is being polluted by sewage. Now, one conservation charity says the polluted water is causing a decline in insect levels in streams feeding the lake, and that could affect Windermere's wildlife. The water company United Utilities and the Environment Agency say that they're making improvements. Here's our environment correspondent, Judy Hobson. This is Wilfinbeck, a typical Lake District stream which flows into Windermere. There is also a waste treatment works here. It's run by United Utilities and processes sewage from a local village. The conservation charity Wild Fish have been carrying out surveys here. They wanted to know if the treatment works was having an impact on the wildlife. This is a standard kick sampling method where you disturb the substrate and the flow of the water will carry the invertebrates down into the net. Today, we are upstream of the works. On my thumb, we've got a caseless caddisfly larvae. And in the middle of my palm here, there's a, there's a species of stonefly. And these are really the, you know, a fundamental um, part of the food web. The survey found that downstream from the treatment works, the river fly numbers fell by 75%. The first indications are really quite striking in that uh, our data seems to be showing that below the United Utility assets in particular, we're seeing really strong declines in some of these species that we look for as, as indicators of pollution in the environment. Over the past few years, Windermere has become the focus of national concerns over sewage pollution. Wild Fish is working alongside the Save Windermere campaign. We know there's a problem with Windermere. It's like sites like this that feed into these little rivers that then slowly accumulate in uh, Lake Windermere itself because Windermere is essentially this giant basin that collects what we put into it. At nearby Kunzebeck, a site of special scientific interest, there is another treatment works. Here, downstream, wild fish found a 76% decline in the abundance of river fly numbers. Well, now we have data to show it is actively damaging that lower lev level of the food chain. It then starts impacting the fish, which impacts the kingfishers, the otters, the herons. Everything up the food chain then gets impacted when we start seeing these, these insects disappearing. And that's exactly what's happening here in a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a national park in what should be the most idyllic place for nature in the entire UK. The Save Windermere campaign believes the Environment Agency is failing to monitor the becks. An Environment Agency spokesman told us the current monitoring network in the Windermere catchment is one of the most extensive in the country. We have started the process of reviewing all the permits for this lake to identify whether there is any further action we can take. United Utilities told us both plants operate in line with their environmental permits, but we are committed to going further and doing more. We've already started investing a further £41 million at our sites around Windermere. Local residents will now be asked to help survey the abundance of insects in the water. Judy Hobson, BBC Northwest Tonight, Wilfin Beck. Well, United Utilities also told us that the two treatment plants in question are small and service just 2% of the Windermere catchment. The company also says it will be writing to Wildfish to question their selective use of data. Now, Liverpool's museums and galleries get nearly 2 million visitors a year, but for the next two months, those museums could be closed by strike action. The dispute is about a one-off cost-of-living payment, which the museum bosses say they can't afford. Here's our Merseyside reporter, Andy Gill. What do we want? Pickets at the Museum of Liverpool this morning. 
Despite the strike, it was open today, but most of National Museum Liverpool's seven sites were not. The trade union says workers should get a one-off £1,500 cost of living award because pay in this industry is historically low and people are struggling financially. £1,500 might not seem much to a, a museum boss who takes home thousands every month, but to many of our members it might pay for a, the first holiday they've had in 10 years. It might pay for them to clear off their credit card debt. It might pay for someone to have their wheelchair service. Those things that would be transformative to my members' lives. The Liverpool collections, like these Baroque, medieval and Renaissance works at the Walker Art Gallery, are internationally important. The Walker, the World Museum, the Lady Lever Gallery and others were nationalised in 1986 because of fears that the then militant Labour Council might sell them. What do you say to people who might want to visit one of the museums in Liverpool but can't because it's closed because of the action you're taking? If you want to find out more about Liverpool, its city, its culture, its history, you're not going to do that by crossing a picket line and going into a museum. You're going to learn more about the spirit, the nature, the culture, the history, the heritage, the stories of this city by talking to these people who do it for a living, who bring those stories to life. The strike began a week ago. The Merseyside Maritime Museum was among the sites closed today. This strike has already caused significant disruption for Liverpool's museums. Important venues like the World Museum here have been closed all week and it could be a long-running dispute. It's been time to coincide with both the February half-term and the Easter school holidays. The government has said a £1,500 payment should go to all civil servants, but the Liverpool Museum staff are not classed as civil servants and the boss says she just can't afford the payment. We chose to put all of the money we had into consolidated pay awards that happen year on year, that we can improve pay consolidated year on year. The government then announced a one-off payment after we had agreed with the unions what our approach was. The management agree pay for museum staff in general is too low and there needs to be a national debate about that. Andy Gill, BBC Northwest Tonight, Liverpool. Right, let's move on to sport now, and Richard is here. Annabelle. Big weekend for fans of Liverpool and Wigan Warriors. Really is, Annabelle, yeah. The Warriors in the World Club Challenge tomorrow. Cannot wait for that. I'm uh, going to that game. And then uh, Liverpool taking on uh, Chelsea in the Carabao Cup final on Sunday. And as you know, it's uh, all the more important because it's Jurgen Klopp's final season at Anfield. The Reds face Chelsea at Wembley with a long injury list, but are determined to rise to the occasion. Special games need special performances so we have to focus on the performance and special performances need that we lift the stadium we need the fans we go for it yeah liverpool will face sparta prague by the way in the last 16 of the europa league it'll be a huge occasion at the dw stadium tomorrow with wigan warriors taking on the australian champions penrith panthers in rugby league's world club challenge penrith who've won the nrl for the last three seasons are widely regarded as one of the best teams of all time but after seeing neighbors st helens defy the odds against them last season we're going to hoping they can lift the trophy that they last won seven years ago there's been a buzz around the town for quite a bit now. Obviously been sold out for over a month and I don't know why I'm always amazed by Wigan fans. They just seem to turn out in numbers whenever a big game comes around and it's going to make for an unbelievable atmosphere. Um, so yeah, one we're really looking forward to. Best of luck to the Warriors. In Super League tonight, Warrington Wolves are at home to Hull FC. Now, to be a young racing driver from Macclesfield who's being tipped for the top, Joseph Loke, who recently won the prestigious Young Racing Driver of the Year award, is preparing for his debut season in Formula 3. Smaller and less powerful engines, but just a couple of steps away from the glitz and glamour of Formula 1 itself. I went to meet Joseph, and his biggest fan, his mum. Joseph Loke is a young man who isn't hanging around. F1's the goal and F1's the dream and I think it's possible. A dream that moved closer when he was recently crowned Young Racing Driver of the Year. It was, yeah, a dream come true and I wish I could relive it a thousand times again. No wonder, along with a cheque for £200,000, he's following in the tyre tracks of some very famous previous winners. It meant a lot uh, to Joseph, um, but more importantly, it means a lot to his career and hopefully that will just help the momentum that he's got at the moment. Here I come! 
a passion for pace on four wheels that goes all the way back to when Joseph was a toddler and a certain film that fired his imagination. We watched it again and again <laughs> yeah. and again and there was something about it and since then these little guys have been everywhere with us and I've kept them ever since. <laughs> Is a youngster to mark out for future reference, Joseph Lowe. An early sign that horsepower hairpins and high speed would be his calling. Here in the white helmet, this was Joseph's first race when he was 10, the start of a career that has now taken a big step up to Formula 3. We're now talking about people that genuinely are looked at as being in Formula 1 in a few years and I want to make sure that my name's one of them. There's a good, good chance that he's going to be able to make that first step towards uh, Formula 1. All the more impressive for a family that doesn't have the riches of many in what is a hugely costly sport. Last year, they had to generate £400,000 through donations, sponsorship and their own pockets. It does make it nicer every time you beat them, the, the, the kids that have a lot of money, because... Yeah. Beating the rich kids. Exactly, yeah. We have struggled a lot. If he wasn't getting these awards, if he wasn't getting these results, if he, if he wasn't working so hard, he wouldn't get the recognition and we wouldn't have the help that we've had. I'm pinching myself now. Yeah. It's extraordinary. Even 12 months ago, if you'd have said, next year you are going to be going to Bahrain, to Melbourne, to Monaco, to see him have a good race and get out of that car, take his, his helmet off, and just the pure joy on his face is incredible. It's meant to be, it's meant to be, and it'll, it will happen, and I'm doing everything in my power to make sure it does. And with an attitude and a talent that marks him out as special, you wouldn't be surprised to see Joseph lining up on that Formula One grid before too long. Do you know what, Annabelle? Yeah. yeah, it was so great to meet Joseph and his and his mum Moira. It would be amazing if he wouldn't could realise that dream, wouldn't it, yeah. and get to Formula One? Oh, I mean, he seems like a really confident together lad, doesn't he? And he's got good support behind him. And so. He's worked so hard as well. Um, his first race is a week today, by the way, good in Bahrain. Um, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, should mention as well, football tonight, Preston North End are at Coventry in the Championship uh, in League One, Wigan hosting Cheltenham as well. Richard, thank you very much. Now. I know you would never do this, and I mean that sincerely. I know you would <laughs> it's never do anything something like I would this. Do. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. If you have not heard of the term mansplaining, it refers to men dishing out advice to women without being asked, often to someone more qualified. As Liverpool PGA pro golfer and coach Georgia Ball now knows all too well, she's gone viral with a video capturing the moment a man golfer critiqued her technique being viewed more than 10 million times. She's been speaking to Ian Haslam. This is Liverpool pro golfer Georgia Ball doing what she does best. I mean, that is a nice swing, Georgia. Though one observer <laughs> surprisingly saw room for improvement. Excuse me. You, what you're doing there, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be right through, swing, follow through. No, you're doing too slow on the way up. Okay. At the time, it was it was an awkward conversation to have, but you know I was that concentrated on what I was there for. I was doing my golf tips. I was working on my swing, as you could see. I kind of was able to brush it off. You know, I've been playing golf for 20 years. What you need to do is is follow through a lot quicker than what you're doing there right now. I'm glad I can look back at it now and, and see the funny side to it. I keep hearing the term mansplaining being used, yet you were very calm and polite. I'd never kind of say, I'm a professional golfer, I, I'm not. I'm a PJ pro, I know what I'm talking about. It's n just not in me t to say that. The TikTok video has now been seen by millions worldwide. There's a seriously viral video going around of a guy giving a woman unsolicited advice on her golf swing. Now this clip of pro golfer Georgia Ball practising at a driving range has gone viral. I'm just making everything. Just hit one, just hit one, sir. Oh, stop talking! Oh! See how much better that was? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I don't think that was... Yeah. Keep doing that anyway, okay? <laughs> thank you, advice. No of course he took credit for her swing. 
This guy, though, to his credit, did have 20 years' experience of golf, as he, uh, as he made quite clear on more than one occasion. So uh, did that help in any way, what he was offering I mean, you? the advice he gave was great advice, and that's the thing, like, I get some really, really good advice come my way, and everything is so positive. <laughs> Georgia's previously gone viral with some of her coaching videos. So I'm going to go half a pitch and wedge, just make sure it gets there. While this one at Liverpool's Albert Dock also went global. Get in, get in, get in! Yeah! You had a fair old audience on social media before all this, but apparently it's growing and growing now. Yeah, yeah, it has. The support's been incredible. The All the likes, the shares, the comments. Any kind of publicity in golf, I think, is huge just to get as many people involved as we can. Ian Haslam, BBC Northwest Tonight. Georgia is so lovely. I don't know if I could have been that polite Absolutely to him. Absolutely not. <laughs> There's not a chance we would have done that. No. We would have I been meant terrible. well, but, uh, yeah. A anyway, much better person than I'm not going to tell you how to do the weather. <laughs> <laughs> Now then, well, she could. I mean, some people have today because there was a bit of anger about the showers. Some of them really were quite sharp. Let's look at the positive. First of all, on the Isle of Man, Douglas, a beautiful start to the day. But in came those showers, technically still showers because there were blue skies around them, but they were heavy, as Peter pointed out in Bolton, where we did see a beautiful rainbow. Now, you wouldn't have got that rainbow, Peter, would you, if you'd not had the sun as well? So, heavy showers. Now, over the weekend, actually, it's not looking too bad. There will be some showers tomorrow, but Sunday promises, we hope, to stay dry. We'll talk about this guy in a minute. Now, as we head through this evening, if you are going out, there are still showers out and about. Now, over the highest of the ground, over the Pennines, over the Fells, you could well be a bit wintry. For a lot of us, they'll be falling as rain, and a lot of us will actually stay dry. Clearest of the skies across Merseyside, down to minus one. There'll be some patches of mist and fog forming, and it'll be a cold and frosty start for some. So tomorrow, yes, there are just a few showers. You can see them starting to creep in. They are few and far between. Where you get them, particularly over the hills, they could be a bit sleety. Temperatures pretty much average for this time of year, between about 7 and 9 degrees with a light breeze. And the breeze stays light overnight into Sunday. It's this area of low pressure. Now, it's developing in the south. It, at the minute, is staying away from us. It could just increase the wind speed as we head through the afternoon on Sunday and the amount of cloud we'll get. It'll be a cold and a frosty start. Decent spells of sunshine, but yeah, we are likely to see more in the way of cloud developing into the afternoon. The breeze just starts to pick up a little bit and temperatures, again, average for the time of year. And Monday doesn't look too bad at all either. Good, good. Um, I'm not going to ask you what you're doing at the weekend, because after last week... <laughs> well, I definitely won't be going to a surprise party. <laughs> That's what I won't be doing. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs> Bye. Take care.